Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today, I have with me Jose Murillo. He is the Chief Analytics Officer at Mexico's second lar largest financial services group called Banorte Financial Group. Um, and we're talking about how the journey he's been on and how he's taken um, massive strides in the execution and delivery of value um, and creating an enhanced bank uh, through the application of data and analytics. I'm super excited to have uh, Jose here with me. So I'd like to welcome you to the show, Jose. Thanks for coming along. Good morning, uh, Jason. I'm delighted to be here with you today. Looking forward to talking through your story. Now, I, I know that this, um, the work that you've done, A, is fantastic because we had a brief chat before, but it's also very well uh, documented in the press and it's, it's, um, it's represented in academia, which I'm, I'm hoping we can come on to. Um, so really exciting to have you on the show. I think you've done some fantastic stuff. I'm looking forward to sharing this with uh, all of our wonderful listeners. Um, so should we get stuck in and kick off talking a bit about um, the bank? Um, we get to understand about um, uh, uh, Banorte generally, but also uh, you and your background uh, before we get into a bit of the work that you guys have been up to. Yeah, sure. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about my background. I'm a PhD trained economist. Uh, the first part of my uh, career, I spent at, uh, research, at the research department at uh, the Central Bank of Mexico. In uh, my uh, prior to my departure, the uh, uh, I was during a good deal of that time. Uh, I was uh, on the Mon monetary policy committee with uh, uh, help uh, with the staff's view on, on a key variable for a monetary policy decision. And uh, I also developed the first app for the for the central bank and. And at some point uh, in my early 40s, I kind of like uh, reinvented myself to become a, a data scientist uh, at a private bank. Right. And uh, in uh, so the journey of uh, my journey to become a data scientist started at Panorte in uh, uh, 2014, something like that. And uh, I what made uh, you what made you make the switch, Jose? I, I, I guess I was curious of doing something else. Uh, you know, I've been quite uh, successful at what I've done at, at the central bank, and and uh, and I guess it's a mixture of opportunity. Of, uh, I was uh, of doing something that you know that, that there, there's uh, an open window to do something else, and and my willingness to uh, to try something different. Right. Um, yeah. So in uh, at, at the time, uh, Banorte was the long tradition in the Mexican market. It's, it's an institution that had uh, almost 130 years in the Mexican market, right. but it was uh, facing uh, tough challenges at the time. It was had a declining ROE and, uh, and uh, were kind of like uh, lagging behind international competitors. Right. And uh, so there was a decision in uh, I guess in uh, uh, to transform uh, the financial group into a data enhanced organization in which uh, uh, it really had a deeper understanding of the customers. And uh, so lots of changes started like uh, happening in the 2015 with a new guard uh, on a new, uh, a new CEO, a new uh, chief operating officer, a new president of the board. And uh, since then, uh, just to make a long story short, uh, Banorte leapfrog international competitors such as Citibank and Santander to become the second largest uh, financial group, as you said. Pre-pandemia, the most profitable. Post-pandemia, I guess we are now the, still the most profitable or the second most profitable and certainly the best capitalized uh, financial group in the, in the Mexican industry. So. Uh, Things have worked well, and uh, and uh, on data science specifically, through during this uh, since 2015, uh, uh, we've uh, yielded more than than uh, four billion dollars in uh, net revenue for the financial group uh, linked to data science projects. So it's has kind of like worked worked well our strategy. Yeah, it's a so nice. Uh, yeah, well, that, it's a fantastic return, and. Um, I think just the fact that you know the return is a really good step. Um, <laughs> often, uh, chief uh, 
uh, analytics and chief data officers I talk to aren't either haven't yet delivered or aren't sure what's been delivered or, or can't convince people that the, the work that they had did contributed to uh, an incremental improvement. So um, congratulations on all those things. And I, I'm really looking forward to digging into that into that a, a bit more. Um, so I guess that's that's a good sort of segue really into trying to understand um, a bit about that four billion dollars uh, and and you know that that's a fantastic success. But I guess you know you have you have to start with one dollar um, and build up to four billion. So so what what was kind of the way you approached um, identifying where that value might be um, and and how did you and you know what kind of use cases what kind of areas of the organization did you focus efforts to make sure that you got you know some return um and obviously resulted in a in a fantastic return over the last six years that's a very good question and uh and uh, the way that we started was uh the very first project was uh on um uh, to uh geared towards reducing the cost of risk and uh and to tell you the truth i at, at the time, I was kind of like, although I spent my, my uh, good part of my career at the central bank, that doesn't mean that you understand what are the problems and nuances on, uh, on uh, commercial banking. And, uh, and so it was uh, directed by my, uh, my boss who kind of like recruited me for this position as the chief analytics officer and he said uh, at the time I, I thought it was kind of like a steep uh, target for us to make uh, initially 10 times our cost mm. I thought it was kind of like steep and he said well you should look at, uh, at abating cost of risk and then uh, through this slicing and dicing of the data we kind of like found populations of which we were having an excessive cost of risk and, uh, and that very first project bought us a lot of credibility mm -hmm. and that's something that probably what it's uh, relevant it's on on uh, selecting the right project and uh, cost of risk is, or reducing costs is something that it's very nice in the sense that you are uh, um, it's something that can be proven very easily to the corporation that you've reduced the cost that you said that you've reduced yeah uh, as opposed to revenue generating projects that might take a longer time to mature and have an impact on on uh, on the bottom line yeah yeah and um you so so some combination of identifying a, a not only a a achievable use case for analytics but also one that was needed desired um and, va and valuable to the organization. It wasn't just sort of a play, a play at, uh, uh, at trying to deliver some value. There was some known and quantifiable opportunity. Was it, was it clear how much that would be up, up front um, or, or was it a case of dipping your toe into the water of what opportunity did ex could exist and then, and then extrapolating out? I, I, guess, I guess what happened is that it was a mixture of, again, it was, uh, it was a willing partner, the credit card division, Mm. And uh, and uh, and the size of the opportunity that uh, and and I, I guess the third part is the immediacy of the result that would grant yeah. us a lot of credibility among the corporation and uh, and that was something that was quite uh, quite neat in the, in the, for picking the projects and I guess that's something that we we're still doing it's, it's uh, we we'll look at the potential uh, return on investment. Mm. Plus the feasibility of of really doing it with all the complexities that a that a prop that a project might have. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it's not only it, it, it's not only about becoming uh, smarter, but uh, to enrich our customers, our still you know our stockholders, every every stakeholder within uh, that has anything to do with an So yeah, it's not only the to understand much better but but at the end of the day to uh to have a, a real impact on the bottom line yeah yeah that's what it's what it's all about it's what you're what we're, we're all here for to to support and, and deliver so did you i think you said that you're you were looking for 10 return of 10 times your cost um obviously to cover your cost and and some did you achieve that well that was the first that was the target on the first year we did 46 times our cost right. last year we did 250 times our cost so oh, wow. we kind of like 
exceeded uh, with a, with an increasing base. Yes. So, uh, so in some yes, sense, your, team, yeah. your team's grown as well. I yeah. guess your cost base has grown yeah. for the return. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's uh, something that has kind of like uh, worked well. Is that um is that how you've gone about um sort of thinking about the return um it, it but sort of it's almost a cost plus uh, scenario you've got there where you you know how much your cost you know you're costing the organisation but it but you're obviously delivering way more than that because otherwise there's no you know what's the point what's the value what's the incremental gain it, but but is that the approach you've had to this or is that just the way you've been able to better articulate um your standing within the organisation. The, the way that we were built was to uh, when uh, when they founded the, the, the group, they asked us to uh, uh, we were built as a profit center in some sense. Okay, we we were so the, the, those targets were were part of the deal of, for funding the the group, and so it was uh, initially, I guess. Uh, it was a part, and, 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 and you said it correctly, a lot of people don't really measure what is the, uh, their contribution to an organization and not only in analytics or data science. And you think that people within our industry are experts measuring lots of things, but very few people are measuring their own contribution. And I think that even if it was a blessing in this in these guys that we were, asked to measure the um, uh, our own uh, contribution mm. and that it was a prerequisite to get the funds necessary to start up because I think it would be it's it's a you know anywhere that you are in an organization you should be what's uh, uh, how much are you contributing and and uh, how much you're worth to, to an organization and uh, and it's uh, and and it has to do to the, I guess in two streams the, the for the organization point of view it's if you really know where's the value you can focus all your efforts in, in things that are valuable and 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 you know at the end of the day everybody ha- are has uh, scarce resources mm. and uh, and you have to be focusing on uh, you know those scarce resources on things that are value of value mm. and then on on a more personal side if you, uh, if you, for the development of your own career or of your own team, uh, if you are wasting your time in things that are not really valuable or are not feasible, then uh, it's hard for you to, to make any progress. Yeah. What gave you the confidence to, I, I almost, I don't know if accept the right word, but accept being a profit center? Because I think that's, there's a, there's a risk attached with um there's a risk attached with being a profit center in some ways in, in terms of your own career and development, you know, and, and so, so did you, did you have some insight into where the opportunity was before saying, yeah, we can, we can seriously add some value here. Um, or is it just, you knew based on, you know, previous experience that, that there must be some, some gold in there somewhere. I guess it was a big gamble in, in, in some sense. And, uh, and it was a kind of leap, leap of faith. And, uh, as I said, my, uh, my boss, who, uh, it's a very much experienced banker. I guess he understood that there were big pockets of value that we could, uh, yeah. where we could uh, uh, uncover, uh, you know, new things. And uh, uh, you know, it, this is a good story with a good ending at the end yes. of the day. Uh, but if it, it, it uh, and it could have gone the other way, and and uh, and I guess. Uh, uh, a lot of these stories, you don't really kind of like credit enough the luck that you've had in what you've done mm. in picking the right project, in picking the right partners. And uh, and uh, so there's, yeah, it, uh, after six years, you can say, well, 250 times the cost, it's amazing. And it's, uh, but, uh, but, but yeah, I guess there's uh, a big part of the, uh, a lot of effort that you, you end up putting, but lots of people put effort in things that they don't have these yield. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, you, you put it down to some luck there. And of course, there's something that plays a part there. But, but, but picking, as you say, picking the right use case, having the right team, focusing on the right things, building the right stuff, having the right partners, you know, that 
a lot of that isn't luck. There's a there's a there's a there's a craft to that, isn't there? It, you know, I often talk about this the uh, this space being very maths and science based, but that none of that is maths and science. That's all art and leadership and management and smarts to put the right things together and focus on the right the right out uh, the right outcomes that that the, that the organization wants and desires and, and frankly needs. And 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 if you have, I guess if you and, and that's something that I, I think that. Uh, I kind of like now believe in, in, in it. It's that uh, if you find find a good uh, champion within a, within an organization, and that you can, that's that's crucial mm-hmm. because after our first uh, big hit, then we started to have a very uh, productive uh, collaboration with the credit card uh, company, mm-hmm. and uh, and and since then, it's I guess one of the, the businesses that we have. Uh, a lot of work and it has become very sophisticated the, the, the work that, that we are now doing with them yeah. and uh, we kind of like uh, uh, went up in the scale of of, uh, of things that are have an impact and, and that are interesting and, and that really uh, translate into a much better service for our customers and, uh, and so it's kind of like a virtuous cycle that has emerged Yes, success breeds success. Are you, are you, as most of the work um, that you've done, you mentioned about um, sort of risk and cost reduction being certainly the early focus. Has it remained the focus to to kind of reduce, or is there more um, sort of incremental <laughs> revenue top line um, improvement as well? It has changed, and it changed really quickly. Uh, right. On the first year, it was very important. To, cost abatement on risk, uh, operational and financial. Mm. And it was kind of like about half of what we were yielding were related to those type of projects. Now it accounts for about uh, a bit less than 10% of what we are, we are doing. Right. And, uh, and most of our, our work is related to revenue enhancing uh, initiatives. And uh, we have right now spend to we work with all uh, the retail banking verticals, also with our insurance company, with our retirement uh, company, with uh, our funds, uh, you know, uh, wealth management, mm. and also with uh, with staff uh, uh, areas that are very relevant for uh, for the bank, such as human resources or fraud detection. Right. So it kind of has spanned through through all the organization, mm-hmm. and uh, and I guess that uh, uh, now the company has a, a mindset that it's very open to uh, uh, experimentation, using data in in, in uh, taking their decisions, and it's uh, uh, it's not only that you have a center of excellence, but now it's something that has matured across all the company. Yeah, I, I think I'd like. Yeah, we could come on to that actually in terms of how you're how you're set up, how you started, and sort of where where you're at now. Um, you um, just sort of before we move on to that, I, I know I mentioned at the start, but um, that 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 this sort of success story which you've had, which I'll say again is is incredible. A the, the just the raw number in terms of return, but, but also the kind of the um, the the comparison to the sort of cost that you've put into to try and create that. I think that's incredible. Um, you, you, um, this, you sort of tell, you've told this story, but, but also it's covered as a case study in, in academia, right? That you, you've, um, and you partner with some academia to kind of get some of this work done. How, how does that, how did that come about? And, and, and what element of this is covered? Which, which bit of this story is, uh, is interesting in academia? You know, it's, uh, those are the things that one, one of the things that are we enjoy a lot. It, it's uh, our work with uh, academic partners, mm. and it's something that also has helped us attract top talent to, to, yeah. to the team because you know there are these young, uh, smart people that are coming to Banorte. And part of the, the I guess the value proposition that we have for them is that uh, they'll be interacting with these super smart people. Mm. So we have a. a, a now a long run uh, partnership uh, going on with uh, uh, the Center for Advanced Hindsight from Duke University that it's ran uh, by uh, Professor Dan Ariely. Okay. He's a top-notch behavioral economist. We've, uh, 
we are partnered with uh, uh, the, have partnerships with a couple of uh, Harvard professors from the business school. And uh, one of them uh, actually wrote a case study that it's been taught at, uh, at uh, the Harvard Business School. We've worked with uh, the Human Dynamics Lab from the MIT. And uh, we have uh, partnerships right now with uh, professors from uh, Chicago University and Carnegie Mellon, with uh, the University of California, San Diego. We are, we're, we've been working with their Master in Analytics program. Uh, super smart people there, and uh, we're, uh, we work with them. We, how it's our second year working with them. And uh, and uh, yeah, it's one of those things that we are. What we are trying to do is to shorten the length of time from uh, from uh, when the knowledge is created, and uh, and uh, and the time that we are able to implement those uh, that knowledge for for understanding much better our customers. For so example, from a, we are, from a research kind of point of view. So when some new um, um, researchers on earth you, you want to apply that into your models into your thinking try something out is that is that what you mean yeah yeah and for example there's plenty of use cases that we've uh, on which we've incorporated uh, uh behavioral economics social psychology and anthropology into our understanding much better the customers right. and then there's a very cool thing that we've done uh, to uh, implement uh or i guess among the first to implement uh Council machine learning uh, algorithms to uh, to to uh, identify what it, what are the right populations on which we want to uh, to expand successful pilots that we are uh, that we ran right. at a small scale. So mm-hmm. part of the, the so the, the I guess everybody tells you yeah you should uh, you know uh, run small pilots and and uh, and if you are if they are unsuccessful you kill them and if you are successful scale them up. But the, part of the trick is how you scale it scale it up fast yep. and understand to who you should scale mm. those uh, successful interventions. And there's where uh, council machine, machine learning has helped us a uh, big deal. Right, fantastic, great. Well, um, I, yeah, the, the link with academia I think sounds like it's got some it's it's it, yeah a few angles um, and again the, the kind of link with smart people into you know for your, from a recruitment point of view is brilliant um and needed as well because because it's it could be quite easy to sort of get get those and those degrees and then end up not applying the knowledge quick enough but also this idea that you take you know research you take new learning that has come out of um academia and apply that quickly to to business scenarios i mean that takes that takes and, and, some some and, i guess a cultural understanding uh, and a cultural belief and a mindset within the organization that you i mean you're, you're doing some pretty leading edge stuff on some very business critical functions right the examples that you gave how, how have you managed to kind of engender that idea that spirit that acceptance that that's okay and that kind of experimentation that first to market on new things is the right thing to do you know i think one of the things that has helped us a lot and i mean something that we like kind of like my way of thinking has evolved through time and uh and 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 that is that uh, basically we uh We've ran several workshops, data science workshops, and uh, behavioral economics workshops through the organization, right. and uh, and uh, and our colleagues from the different business lines are are themselves. Uh, after those workshops, they propose their own uh, initiatives and projects, so that we can they can um, themselves build their their own. Uh, you know, they're upon their own ideas. And that's something that I guess everybody kind of like, you know, kind of like learning by doing yeah. has, uh, has really uh, advanced a, a lot the way that, uh, that our uh, colleagues understand what, you know, what we do and, and, uh, and uh, turn them into promoters on, on, uh, on, uh, on our own efforts. So you, yeah, you, you're creating, 
you're not you're not creating a, a yes. um, bottleneck into your organization um you're you're enabling the organization to crack on with what they need to do supported by you know the products that you've built and the 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 the, the um the solutions that you've got in place so yeah it's not 100 percent reliant on your team but you've got this sort of partnership model yeah yeah and uh, at, at the end it's that uh, we have uh you know initially it was a and we are built as a center of excellence, right. and 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 it happened that a lot of the, the 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 ideas were kind of like very much uh, grown from. They were more kind of like supply driven from us to the rest of the organization, mm. and it's and now it's it's something that it's more general, and and I think we gotta move at a fast, much faster pace. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's fantastic. Um, can we talk a bit? It sort of leads nicely into sort of talking a little bit about um, how you're set up. So, I, I, the first thing I wanted to kind of pick up on is, is so you're the chief analytics officer. Um, so, it'd be good to understand the sort of span of your responsibility, your accountability, um, and who are your kind of key partners in crime to um, get this thing done. Um, so, yeah, so, so the role of the chief analytics officer, what is it and what isn't it? So it, the way that we are set up, it's, uh, and, and for this thing to work, and I, I, I guess we talked about it, you need uh, the data, the technology, and the brains. Mm. And uh, so that's kind of like prerequisite. Yeah. And so we, we ha- I work very closely with, uh, there's a chief data officer who is in charge of, of, of having the right uh, you know, the, having the data that it's accessible, a single source of truth, and you know, all that part, and, and he's awesome. But we're kind of like independent of each other. Yeah. Then uh, you have uh, technology and innovation that it's something uh, that we work very closely, but everybody's kind of like independent. We're independent right. of each other. And then you need uh, lots of people to uh, once you have that kind of like basic setup and, and, and as a chief analytics officer, my m- mandate in some sense, it's uh, very much focused on creating value. And, uh, and that's, uh, uh, so what I am supposed to do is like to find those opportunities where we can enhance uh, one, the key metric that I'm after, it's the customer lifetime value. So right. how can I extend or deepen the business relationship with our customers? Okay. And, uh, and to be able to do that, I need uh, the help of uh, my colleagues on the business side also, which are uh, uh, the product, uh, product owners, the segment owners and the channels. Yeah. And uh, as you might imagine, a key partner, it's, uh, since a lot of what we do is go, going through digital channels, it's, uh, uh, that's something that is very relevant for us. And we are also focused on, on enhancing the usage of, of, those, of those channels so that, and, and the products. And so it's kind of like, a, it's, it's not like tennis, it's more like soccer in the sense that it's, a large team that you need to uh, to be moving these things. Yeah, how um, how do you how do you stay aligned with the technology and the uh, um, and the CDO in terms of priorities? Then, because you know it sort of works top down, doesn't it? You said you've got you know say customer engagement as the as the you know your metric, for example, or retention or cross sell, whatever it might be. So you've got the business need, you've got the analytics products that your team. Is producing to to help and enable and support and guide those those business opportunities, but underpinning that is a clean set of data that's trusted and good quality and secure, and and, and there's technology that wraps around that. How, how do you kind of keep that that line of sight between the business need and, and the work that all these separate teams need to do? Because I feel like that could be quite run away with itself quite easily. Yeah, that that's a great question, I, and I guess through time we're much better coordinated, and uh, and the big coordination mechanism is that. Uh, the revenue that we are generating is what it's paying uh, the, the technology investments and uh, data investments that the company uh, does. So follow so that, the, follow that, the money. That, yeah, so that, that, yeah. that kind of like uh, aligns us 
mm. quite quickly. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Follow follow the money, follow the opportunity. <laughs> um, yeah, know know where your uh, whether where what what drives you and what feeds you. So that that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and and do you have do you have influence then over um, you know data challenges, technology choices? And I, I know I know certainly from um, sort of advanced analytics, machine learning, data science lens, there's, there's often new tools, new technologies, new approaches required so are you, are you do you, i guess you have a level of autonomy as well over some of that or do you do that in conjunction with your technology um partners? we we uh at the end i have uh i have uh i have uh i don't know what the, the, the word that you said it's yeah we have a voice in a, a, a in what technology we need mm. and uh, and we have uh but at the end it's not uh, it's something that we kind of like have the assistance from yeah. uh, the technology and innovation departments to uh, to get it purchased or get it developed or uh, whatever yeah. it's the case. And uh, and in the list of those priorities, we it's where we have a saying and uh, and what are the characteristics. And it's something that we have uh, there a large input in, in what it's uh, bought or developed and 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 on what priorities. Good. Yeah, make, makes sense. No, that's good. Um, I'd just like to return, if we can, to um, a kind of this idea of experimentation. So I, I sort of asked you earlier about um, like culture, <laughs> culture and mindset needed to have an organization that accepts a level of experimentation and, and try some things. Um, what about the but from a, like a process or approach perspective? So experimentation usually starts with trying something. That's the experiment. Um, and then you need to scale it. So um, how, how have you gone about, what's the mechanism you use? Are you, are you, um, do you have like a, a you know, a, 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 an approach for, you know, the th testing a bunch of things, progressing the things that work, moving those things into sort of scale, um, getting investment at certain stages of that to push them harder? H how does that work from an idea to an experiment to a, you know, prototype to a scale, to a scaling it up? It has. Uh, that's something that we have changed in in uh, in time. The first experiments that we ran, it took us a uh, long time to launch them. Uh, uh, they were trimmed down during the process, and mm. and then to measure it was kind of like uh, long time, long time. And we we kind of like made all the investments so that we could uh, first set them up, set them up, set them up quickly, and measure fast. And uh, that's something that. Uh, that it's more kind of like having the 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 right you know develop the, the algorithm so that you can do it fast. But the hard part is to have this uh, agreement within the corporation that you are going to be running these tests and and so that everybody kind of kind of feels relaxed about uh, running these small going to test something. And that's something that, uh, as I said, data literacy has helped a lot for, for people understanding what you want to do. Right. And uh, nowadays, from uh, from the time that you have an idea and you implement, it's something that it takes us between 48 and 72 hours. We are running about uh, three uh, experiments per week with different interventions within each, each experiment. Right. And, uh, and and I guess a lot a lot of the times they were initially a lot of these experiments were ran by uh, were kind of like very academic in the sense that they were inspired by a lot of the literature that there is out there. And uh, and then after we ran a, a bunch of those experiments, we kind of like did a meta analysis of the different experiments that we ran and understood very well where you know each independent uh, experiment you know has a lot of value. But, uh, but then you have to measure them up against each other. As I said, you have scarce resources and how you're going to focus on what's more valuable. And, and what we understood that had the most impact after those, and, and we try to focus on those things that are having the largest return on investment since we're a uh, profit center, it's to, re to, to change those things where you're removing or imposing, in, in the case you need, barriers with the, in, in, within uh, the interaction with the customer. 
Right. So uh, an example of, uh, you know, removing a barrier that might be, you know, be uh, you're forcing the customer to, uh, you want the customer to save more for tomorrow. And you ask the customer, what do you want to save more for tomorrow? And it's something that you're inadvertently placing a barrier with the interaction with the customer that, you know, the, suddenly you're asking, do you want to save more for tomorrow? That's one question. And then you ask him, ask him well, why, why do you want to save more for tomorrow? And then what it might end up happening is that you will procrastinate the decision because you say, why? Well, I haven't thought about that. So maybe I won't start saving more for tomorrow now. And, uh, and as opposed to, to, and that's kind of like removing a barrier that it's kind of invisible, but that you had the good intention of, of, yeah. of when, when you set it up and, and it was kind of inadvertently. And then you, uh, in a case in which you're placing a barrier, you, you get, in, get into the app and then I suddenly put a pop-up uh, before you do a transaction and I ask you, Jason, do you want to save more for tomorrow? And, th- and so those, th- Impose, removing or imposing barriers is something that can help very much in building those uh, that uh, business relationship with the customer. It's more kind of like removing that than, than putting barriers. Yeah. Uh, a second thing, it's like having the, the right price, and then you have a bunch of different initiatives on which you you you, you write. You have now a very good understanding of where you'll have the highest return on investment. And nowadays, those that, that knowledge is complemented with business acumen from our partners in the in the business lines that, uh, and uh, and they themselves want to to test some hypotheses. For example, uh, there's a recent one, you know, and, and it's very relevant for remittances. Banorte, it's the the bank that uh, charges the lowest fees for remittances. You know, people right. working abroad and sending money to Mexico. And, and that has, has a big, even social impact. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and there are similar, similar things. When people are using that app to send money home, they, they, they might be facing uh, too many options and they, they have a choice overload. And, and you already know what's the best, to the, you know, the, should they send the money to, uh, to the bank or to be changed uh, to a bank account or, or to be, uh, uh, you know, um, the money at, uh, at, the, at the teller and and, uh, and there's something that are you can uh, have a, a lower costs for the customer and so that they make a, a better decision and so you can kind of like uh, set up the, the right architecture and you can test if, if what your kpis uh, if what you thought that it would happen it would happen yeah. uh, with with these randomized control trials that we are running frequently Mm. How have you um, just to sort of thinking of sort of wrap, wrapping up with this? But um, how have you ratified the value? So you know you talk very openly about the four billion dollars. You know for each piece, have you have you got a you know you got a finance partner that supports you in ratifying that? Do you um, capture it and it feeds into your P and L because you talked about being a profit center? How, how does that process work? Of you know, measuring and capturing and, and uh, agreeing and signing off that, that that benefit's been realized. What you do, it's uh, as you, going back to where we started our conversation, we measure, measure, and measure. Yeah. We measure before we start a project on what would be the potential ROI. Yeah. Then we measure while we're conducting the project to, to validate it, what we thought was it's happening. And then at the end of the day, we do, there's kind of like an accountability process in which we measure what is the final outcome. And uh, by the year end, we do a, a compilation of the different initiatives that we ran. Right. It's not only, uh, uh, so we for each project, we do a, a separate uh, report on which there are the different measures. And it depends on what the nature of of the project that we undertook, it's if it's a cost uh, abatement project, it's something that you can measure the effect contemporaneously. If it's a revenue enhancing project, it's something that we measure the the, the impact on the customer lifetime value. And uh, and uh, at the end, you know, because it can be missed from we ran about eighty or 
plus initiatives per year. Uh, so we made it, we make a, like a book report on uh, which summarizes the key findings and, and the, the, the impacts that we had. And it's something that we present to the, to, uh, to our key partners on which they devoted uh, their time and resources. You know, this is a, a group that is sponsored by the corporation. So it's not as if the credit card company is paying, uh, you know, part of the, the, the services, but, uh, but they are devoting uh, time and they, are, uh, they have their own scarce resources and, yeah. and if they prioritize the data science initiatives of our over, over initiatives, it might, uh, should uh, worth their time. And uh, so it's uh, very kind of like, we try to be very transparent about what are the effects and, uh, and what are the, the impacts and, uh, and it's something that it's, uh, you know, cost uh, abatement strategies, as I said, it's something that it has been uh, validated by the accounting department. Mm -hmm. Revenue enhancing, it's something that there are probably more intermediate metrics that can be, that are shown, like uh, what are, how many credit cards are sold through our initiatives, how, what's the activation rate, what is the spend, what is the risk mm -hmm. of those cards, and then there's you know the, an estimation of what's the, the the impact on the customer lifetime value. The last the last uh, you know mile it's probably harder for for people to really you know mix all those numbers and say yeah it's uh, that's the, the customer lifetime value that it's a net present value of the, the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. But all the other intermediate uh, numbers are easily validated and are, are actually validated by and are actually published by my uh, uh, my the CDO and uh, he also publishes the customer lifetime values of the customers and, and so that's something that there's uh, kind of like a validation process that goes that way all right brilliant fantastic well um uh, great to uh, great to hear your your story, Jose. I, I was very much looking forward to to unpicking this, um, and uh, I think there's some so many fascinating things here. My mind's spinning with about another hour's worth of questions for you, but um, I think we'll we'll save that for another day, um, or maybe over a, a, a Thebeta if I can get to Mexico some point. Um, so look, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, as I said, fascinating. Um, can't wait for people to listen. Um, so thanks for coming on the show. Delighted to be here with you today, uh, Jason, and uh, with your uh, audience. Fantastic. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, hope you enjoyed this one. Plenty more to come, and we'll catch you again soon.